Amir Siraj, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me again on the show, John. Now, Amir, you, your your latest paper has, or your latest work has captivated me. The idea of interstellar material, not in our solar system and passing through, but sitting here on Earth where we can study it. Tell us the story of what <laughs> what led to this discovery that an interstellar meteor had entered Earth's atmosphere. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is a. Uh long story in fact it, it it took about three years to unfold um so my my involvement with this meteor started back in april 2019 um my advisor avi Loeb, had brought this this database of meteor fireballs called the cneos database which stands for uh, Center for Near Earth Object Studies. It's hosted um, at NASA JPL, and you know, at that point, we we were eight months into our studies related to Oumuamua, which you know, of course, it had been identified um, about one and a half years earlier as as you know, at the time, that was the first known interstellar visitor uh, to the solar system, and. You know, because of Oumuamua and, and our and our studies of it, this idea that that interstellar objects could carry, you know, unprecedented amounts of information about our, um, you know, local cosmic neighborhood and beyond, w was top of mind for both Avi and myself. And so, Avi and I had been sort of thinking about this possibility of, you know, how do we find others. To study, and this CNEO's database seemed promising. So, you know, within a matter of hours, maybe I think about a day, I had identified this this object, uh, which was which uh, struck off the coast of Papua New Guinea in January of 2014. I had identified it as a potential candidate to be an interstellar meteor. Um, and I emailed Avi right away, and he he suggested that I use the speed of the impact, combined with knowledge of uh, you know how small body populations in the solar system move, to try and get an estimate of the probability that it either originated from one of those populations or that it originated from elsewhere, you know, beyond the the solar system. And you know, after I had contemplated that approach, I proposed a more precise method, you know, in which we could derive the object's trajectory, you know, using the altitude that it burnt, you know, the, the longitude, latitude, altitude, velocity components in, in the X, Y, and Z direction, and of course, the date and time to run you know, time backwards and figure out the object's trajectory while accounting for all of the gravitational influences of the sun and the planets. And so Avi agreed with that proposal and I got to work. <laughs> and, you know, I ended up checking my work about 30 times because I just couldn't believe the results. Um, but, you know, after you know, teasing apart the effects of the Earth's motion around the sun and the meteor's um, motion relative to the Earth, I kept finding the same result, that this object had a heliocentric speed of around 60 kilometers per second, which is well over the threshold, this, this local speed limit at, at the Earth's distance from the sun of about 42 kilometers per second to be bound to the sun. And I just kept getting the same result, that this orbit was clearly unbound. And because it was so, you know, well over the threshold, this would remain the case even if there had been large uncertainty errors in, in the measurements. And so, you know, this, this was um, pretty shocking to me because people have been searching for interstellar meteors for decades. I mean, there's a great paper in 1950 that describes a search for, for interstellar meteors. So may have been, you know, could have even been uh, up to a century. But 
But if these data were correct, then this would be the first interstellar meteor discovered and also the first interstellar object um, to ever be detected by humans. And, and this was sort of just hiding in plain sight. So the thing about the CNEO's database is that it does not contain measurement errors on the velocity components. And, you know, the reason for this is um, somewhat understandable. The measurements are made by classified U.S. government satellites that are designed to detect foreign missile launches. And so the U.S. government doesn't want adversaries to know exactly how precise their sensors are. So Avi and I sort of reversed engineered estimates of these classified satellites measurement errors as it pertains to fireballs by using independently verified data on other fireballs, taking those data and comparing them to the data in the CNEO's database and, and you know, other analyses done uh, throughout the scientific literature about these, these same sorts of um, tests. And after doing that sanity check, we were we were left with the same conclusion that, you know, this is clearly an interstellar object. And so after that, we submitted for publication and the journal referees wouldn't have it because, you know, they were they were uh, upset about the unknown nature of the error bars. So at that point, we enlisted the help of uh, two scientists at Los Alamos National Laboratory, um, Alan Hurd and Matt Hevner. They both had security clearances and they were both interested in, in this sort of uh, collaboration between the public sector and and scientists to, to promote blue sky uh, research. And Matt Hevner was actually able to get in touch with the anonymous analyst who had derived the meteor's velocity components from those classified satellite observations. And he was able to do so because from 2014 through 2018, he worked um, at the White House in the Office of Science and Technology Policy and trying to declassify uh, error bars related to CNEO's data was one of the areas that, that Matt had, had worked on during his time in the White House. So he was a perfect person for the job and and he was able to get a confirmation from the anonymous analyst that the uncertainties for the velocity components in the X, Y, and Z direction were each in no higher than uh, 10%, this, you know, fiducial upper bound that is probably way higher than the actual error bars, but but that was, you know, it's a value that that does not uh, compromise any national security matters, and and it was more than good enough for our analysis. So we we plugged in uh, that value into our analysis, um, and it implied an interstellar origin with 99.999% certainty. And um, at this point, we were feeling uh, pretty good about the discovery, uh, but the paper was again turned down by by referees uh, because the confirmation had been a private communication with an anonymous U.S. government employee, but not an official statement from the U.S. government. And Matt Hevner had difficulty in procuring that. So, you know, after that, um, Matt worked with the editor of the journal to try and uh, identify someone within the government with the proper security clearances um, who also, you know, had a background in physics, you know, physics PhD, and therefore the qualifications to be able to review the claim internally. And, you know, the idea is that this person would serve uh, to, to verify the claim without, um, without actually releasing the data. And so they spend many months trying to identify such a person. I believe at some point they did because I remember getting an email um, either in late 2019 or early 2020 saying that, oh, the the referee 
was unable to travel to the secure location to review the data. And um, it was a whole saga, but eventually, um, you know, Matt Hebner and the journal referee, you know, had to sort of reach a, reach a dead end. So at that point, you know, we we thought that this this uh, discovery would would never be published in in a peer reviewed journal or you know confirmed by you know in, in an official way, and unfortunately had to move on to other research. But about a year later, we were approached by Pete Warden, who is the chair of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. And he introduced us uh, to a fellow named Matt Daniels. And um, at the time, Matt Daniels was working for the office of the Secretary of Defense. And, you know, Matt came from a science and engineering background with a PhD at Stanford. um, And, you know, at that point was working within government. And he had read our preprint um, about the meteor and wanted to help check within the U.S. government and see if he could get an official statement uh, about the true nature of this meteor, um, you know, put out. So he spent uh, the past year navigating, you know, many different levels of of government bureaucracy. And and just uh, this past month, he was able to procure official confirmation uh, from the Department of Defense. And so this this came from Lieutenant General John Shaw, who is the second in command um, at the U.S. Space Command, and um, Joel Moser, who's the chief scientist uh, with a PhD in physics uh, of the Space Operations Command. And they verify that the data reported to NASA on the CNEO's database is sufficiently accurate to indicate an interstellar trajectory. And you know, finally confirms uh, the fact that this meteor was truly of interstellar origin. So that is the uh, the short version of what the past three years have been like. 